If you have your Bibles, grab them and go with me to Psalm chapter 121 this evening. Psalm chapter 121. And uh, I was helped by that visit with the pastor. And I hope you were as well. Psalm 121. If you found your place and if you're willing and able, would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's word? Psalm 121 this evening. We're going to stand out of respect for God's word this evening. Thank you so much. You know, the moment that we say no to the world and yes to Jesus, aren't you glad that all of our problems just immediately go away? <laughs> we never argue with our spouses. Our children always and promptly and immediately obey us. We never get into accidents. Our cars never break down. How many of you think that's your version of Christianity right there, right? I have good news for you. If you think that is what Christianity is, you are wrong. It's not long after we begin our journey with Christ that we realize that there are challenges that confront us along the way. The Christian life is not a walk in the park. It's a race, it's a fight, it's a war. That's how the New Testament describes it. It's a race through hills and valleys. There are ups and there are downs. There are good seasons and there are bad seasons. There's times of blessing and there's times of burdens. There's times of laughter and there's times of sorrow. This is the experience of the Christian life as we journey with Christ. The message of Christ is not that your problems go away. The message of Christ is there, a, there is a person with you while you go through it. It's no different for the writers of the Bible. It's what we're picking up here in Psalm 121. It's a psalm of ascent. This is a psalm that they would have sung, perhaps responsively, as they journeyed to or from Jerusalem. And many people think it was from Jerusalem. I'll point out why here in just a moment. But look with me at verse number one. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. And he will not suffer thy foot to be moved, and he that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would use your word in our lives and en encourage us with it. I pray that you would remind us this evening that you are the one who is keeping us. You are attentive. That we can rest at ease in this life. We can have a peace that passeth understanding. We can be filled with joy even in the face of the most difficult sorrow. Because you keep us. And in Jesus name we pray and all the church said together. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. It's quite possible that this psalm was actually sung on the journey home rather than the journey to Jerusalem. The psalmist looks out at the hills ahead of him and he wonders who will go with him along the way. He thinks that there is nowhere to turn. 
The thought is that he will be all alone. There'll be no one to talk to. There'll be no one to protect him. There'll be no one to journey with him. And then the psalmist remembers that there is a God in heaven who will help him as he climbs any mountain, who will help him solve any problem, who will encourage him and strengthen him to overcome any obstacle. The psalmist really gives us two points. He gives us the first, and that is that I can trust God to provide my needs. Do you believe that this evening? That God is able to meet whatever need is in front of you. The key word of verse number one and verse number two is the word help. He says in verse not one, from whence cometh my help. He says in verse two, my help cometh from the Lord. The psalmist is no different than us. He does what every one of us tend to do when we are in trouble. He looks for help. Only the psalmist looks in every place but the right place. He tries everything but the right thing. He asks every person except the right person. The psalmist looked at the hills in front of him and he recognized that he had a need. This is the same route that Jesus taught about when Jesus says that there is a certain man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. He was beaten and he was stripped and he was left for dead. That's the same journey that the psalmist is speaking of here. That's the place and the psalmist asks the question then, where does my help come from? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a question that I've asked myself time and time again. Where will my help come from? Perhaps you've asked yourself that question. Where am I going to get the help I need for this part of the journey? But one thing is for sure, friend, and that is this, that all of us are in need of help. And that's really the truth that verse number one is reminding us with. He's confronting us with this reality that the journey is long. The road is rough. The burdens are heavy. The climb is steep. The dangers are many. And it is impossible for you and I to make this journey on our own. You need help. One of the great dangers in the Christian life is that we would try to make the journey in the Christian life in self-sufficiency. We convince ourselves that we have to be strong enough or smart enough or tough enough or awesome enough or creative enough. But, but Christian maturity resides when there is a healthy awareness of our dependence on God. If God is for us, well then, who can be against us? And we need help. And perhaps you're aware of this truth. Perhaps you're well aware of this truth. Your marriage needs help. Your parenting needs help. Your career choices, you, you need some help. You got some habits you're trying to kick. You need help. You have, you have temptations you're trying to fight. You need help. Well, can I just remind you, friend, that God has given us a help. And the help that God has given us is found right here in his word. The Apostle Peter writing to the church says that the Word of God contains all things necessary for life and godliness. Did you catch that? That the Word of God tells us everything we need to know about the journey that we are taking in this life. It's the help that we need. But can I also remind you that it's not just the Word of God that God has given us. It's also His Holy Spirit that resides in us. He is a helper. He is a 
comforter. He is the other one that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 14. He's the one who gives us a peace that passeth all understanding. He's the one who convicts us when we go astray. He's the one who illuminates the word of God before us so that it serves as a light to us. God has given you his word and God has given you his spirit. But can I also tell you this? He is not, those aren't the only two helps that he has given us. If those two were it, that would be enough. But God has given to us a local New Testament church which serves as his body in the world. It's his hands. It's his feet. Feet. It's the way in which we feel his love, the most tangible, demonstrable way in which you will ever understand the love of God is found in a local New Testament church. And sometimes people say, well, I, I like Jesus. I just don't like the church. You ever heard somebody say something ridiculous like that? Do You know, Jesus loved the church so much that he gave himself for it. If you love Jesus, you'll love what Jesus loved. Do you know that Jesus referred to the church as his bride? That would be like saying to me, Dave, I really like you. I just can't stand Amanda. Well, if you don't like Amanda, then you don't like me. Because she's with me and I'm with her. This is the truth that we should accept, and that is this, that we all have seasons in our lives where we need help. But the psalmist, he answers his own question. He says this, he says, verse 2, my help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. So it's not only a truth that we should accept, there's a testimony that we should adopt. My help comes from God. My help comes from the one who made everything Everything in heaven and in earth my God made. So what particular area do you need help in? You can ask the creator of it all. Need help in your marriage? That's God's institution. He's the one who ordained it. He's the one who defines it, and he'll help you in it. You need help with your children? They're a heritage and a blessing from the Lord. They're gifts from God to us. You can ask God for it. In fact, there is no area in this world, there is no sphere in which you will ever walk that does not ultimately belong to our God. The psalmist says, my help comes from the Lord. Reminds me of what the Apostle Paul says when he writes to the church. And he says that we have a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. We have a God who is able you ever ask someone for help, but they just weren't able to help you? I mean, they might have been willing, but they weren't able. They might have been glad to be there, but they weren't able to help. Now, we serve a God who is able, the scripture says. Paul reminds the church at Rome about just how able our God is. He says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is that your testimony tonight? I need help. And I found a help. My help is from God who made it all. So this doesn't mean that all other types of help are illegitimate. You should get an education. You should see a doctor. You should work hard. You should plan wise. You should cultivate relationships. Of course, you should do all of these things. It doesn't mean that other helps are illegitimate. It simply means that those things aren't the source of my help. The source of my help is not my education. The source of my help is my God. 
The source of my help isn't my awesomeness or creativity or intellect. The source of my help is my God. The source of my help isn't my savings account and bank account. The source of my help is my God. That's what the psalmist is reminding us of. Is this a testimony you have? And notice in, in verse 2 to verse 3, there's a shift. He speaks of, my help cometh from the Lord. In verse 3, he says, he will not suffer, notice, thy foot. So he moves from my and I, he moves to thy and your. Commentators think that perhaps they did this because it was sung responsively. The, the singer would sing the first two verses and then the congregation would sing the, the last several verses as a chorus back. Some people think that perhaps it was sung as a preacher to his people. He would have preached the first few verses and then he's putting his people in remembrance of the help he needs. And then they all would sing collectively the latter half of the chapter. Others think the psalmist is perhaps just talking to himself. He, he recognizes the journey in front of him. He reminds himself that his help comes from God. And then he begins a conversation where he begins encouraging himself in the Lord. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Do you ever do that? You ever talk to yourself? How many have ever talked to yourself? Let's see. Everyone who didn't raise their hand is talking to themselves right now. Should I raise my hand? I don't know. <laughs> what will people think of me if I raise my hand? Do I talk to myself? I don't know if I talk to myself or not. Amanda tells me all the time, David, I don't care if you talk to yourself, but if, if you start answering yourself, we have a problem. I, I like to think of the psalmist as talking to himself. And if you're going to talk to yourself, listen, friend. Be sure to talk sense to yourself. It does you no good to talk nonsense to yourself. The psalmist is talking sense to himself. He sees the road ahead. He knows the climb is steep. He understands the dangers are many. He has recognized that God is his help. And now he begins, he shall not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. You can read the rest and we will in just a moment, but the key word through the rest of the text is not the word help. The key word through the rest of the text is the word keep. He keeps me. He keeps me, verse number three. He keeps me, verse number four. He keeps me. He is my keeper, verse number five. Verse seven, the Lord shall preserve, literally keep you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord shall preserve or keep you while you're going out and while you're coming in. He keeps me. Simply means he's attentive. His eyes are watching. In ancient times, there were no paved roads. It was only rugged terrain on a, on a well-trodden path. And so as you walked along these paths, it was very easy to stumble and fall. The psalmist is reminding himself that as you journey on this difficult road, God's eyes are on you. You have his full attention. He is aware. The question for the psalmist and the question for us is not, is God's attention arm on me or on you? The question is, is our attention on him? You see, it's when we take our attention off of him that we stumble and fall. Could give countless illustrations on this. I'll just give one. A couple of weeks ago, I was going for a jog after I got off of work. I put my running shoes on. I put my running shirt on. I turn on the podcast that I enjoy listening to as I run and I begin my jog. 
start running down the, the sidewalk. I run past a Target around the back. There's another Home Depot. There's a loading area right there. And as I make my way past the Home Depot loading area, a big semi truck whips right in front of me. It felt like it was this close, you know? So I stop really fast and he just goes on. And I do what any good Christian in this moment would do. I gave him a really mean look. I mean, at this, the side eye, I just, oh, what are you doing? Don't you see me here? So I'm staring at him like this and I start to run past, he's going down the loading area now and I'm staring at him and I we do it like this and we make eye contact through his rear view mirror and I was like, oh, what are you doing? And I'm running and I don't even realize but the sidewalk makes a step up and my foot hits the sidewalk and down I go. And he just laughed, honked his horn, <laughs> thought it was hilarious. What do you do when you're in trouble? What do you do when someone cuts you off in the loading area? You know what most of us do? Exactly what I did. We take our eyes off of the journey, the path, the route that God has given us and we put our eyes on someone other than what Christ is doing in us. And we trip and we stumble and we fall. It's not that God's attention isn't on you. Is your attention on him? So that as you walk through this life, he keeps your foot from being moved. You see, as you walk with God, as you keep your focus on God, as you lift your eyes to God, as you put your attention and your heart and your pursuit in him, he gives us spiritual stability. He gives us a stability that otherwise we wouldn't have had because the terrain was too rough, because the climb was too steep, because the dangers were too many. The Lord keeps us three ways. Notice the Lord keeps our feet safe. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. It's not a guarantee that we never fall. What it is, is it's an assurance that he will keep your feet stable as you travel because you and I are prone to fall. And in fact, the only reason we haven't fallen into slippery places already the only reason we haven't been given over to hidden temptations, the only reason we haven't surrendered in dangerous situations, the only reason we haven't wandered off into doctrinal errors is because God is the one who is keeping us. He keeps us. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. In other words, he never dozes off. Some of you, you can't say that. I'm watching you right now. <laughs> he never sleeps. He never gets tired at the wheel. He never turns on the baby monitor to go to the other room in order to get some shut eye. He never does this. He is always alert. He is always awake. He's always attentive. His eyes are always on us. The image is a picture of a soldier who's on duty, who stays awake, lest the enemy come over the wall and overrun us. This is our God. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get drowsy. He doesn't get sidetracked. He doesn't get distracted. His eyes are on us. And someone asked Alexander the Great one time, how is it that he could sleep when he was surrounded by so much danger? Alexander the Great replied, I sleep because Perminio is watching. Perminio was Alexander's faithful personal bodyguard. 
Can I ask you, friend, if Alexander the Great can sleep because a human bodyguard is watching him, then how much more should you and I be able to rest knowing that the infinite God of the universe who has no beginning, who has no ending, and who never gets tired in the middle is watching over us? We ought to be able to say, I can sleep because God is watching me. Look at verse four, he says, behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. This is a reference to God's faithfulness in the past. You're always in danger of forgetting the faithfulness of God when you measure the faithfulness of God on your present circumstance. Don't judge God's faithfulness on your present circumstance. No, no, no. Check God's performance review. And you know what David is saying? God has kept Israel all along the way. And God will keep us still. It is God who has kept, David is saying. And so it is God who will keep. The Lord keeps your feet safe. The Lord keeps your hands strong. That's what he says in verse five, in verse six, the Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. Kinder, in his commentary on the Psalms, he actually offers a lot of help in this passage. He says, the psalmist is offering a pair of opposites, the sun and the moon, and he's offering them to include everything in between. The psalmist is saying, you won't die because of sunstroke and you won't lose your mind because your moon's sick. The psalmist is saying, you would have suffocated under the circumstances, the all-consuming circumstances of this life had it not been the Lord who was providing shade for you. And you would have lost your mind in the craziness of this world had it not been God who was guarding your thoughts. See, friend, it was God who was keeping us all along the way. It was God who's keeping our feet. It was God who's keeping in our hands. It was God who's keeping our minds. And we're going to see in a second, it is God who is keeping our soul. It's God all along the way. And notice, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade. I don't have to tell you who live in the Antelope Valley about the importance of shade. But you must remember that they don't live in a time where they can run air conditioning to air conditioning without shade. It's the difference between life and death. God is their shade. And notice where he is providing the shade. He's providing the shade. Notice, upon thy right hand, it speaks of his personal presence. God's presence is with me. So it is not just that God is up in heaven on his throne looking down over us. That is true, but that is not all of the truth. No, it is God who is at our side, who is shielding us from the circumstances of this life, from the harm that is around us. And he is providing a shade for for us it is God who keeps my feet. It is God who keeps my hands. And then the psalmist ends quite simply. It is God who keeps your life. He keeps your life secure. That's verse seven. That's verse eight. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. The Lord keeps us from all evil. Seems to be saying that nothing bad happens to us. But it can't mean that, can it? It's not the experience. We've all lived long enough to know this. 
There's no, there's no exemptions from the difficulties of life. So what do you do when you come to a passage like this where it says, the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He'll preserve your soul. He'll preserve your going out and your coming in. And sometimes it helps when you come to a verse like this to step back a little bit, look at the full context. Of course, he doesn't keep us from all evil. The first verse, he tells us we're going to face trouble. We're, we're going to face difficulty. So, so this verse is not guaranteeing a life of health, wealth, and success. The psalmist has already acknowledged, along the journey of life, I need help. If, if the psalmist is saying God keeps us from all evil, ask yourself, what would Joseph's interpretation of this psalm be? The Lord keeps me from all evil when my brothers sold me into slavery. The Lord didn't allow my foot to be moved while I was thrown into a pit. The Lord kept my going out and my coming in while I was in Potiphar's house, falsely accused. You know, see, the, the answer above what this verse really must mean is found at the end of Joseph's life. When Joseph comes face to face with his brothers who had done him so wrong. And in verse 20 of chapter 50, Joseph says to them, Know what you meant for evil? God used for good. You see, friend, there are some things that only the perspective of time and eternity will give us an understanding of what God is actually doing. It is Foolish to think that you and I could possibly understand all that God is up to. Isaiah says his thoughts are higher than ours. His ways, they're much broader than ours. His, his plans for us, they're deeper than anything that we could ever possibly imagine. There are some seasons of life that will only ever be understood on the other side of eternity. In view of eternity, God keeps my soul. That's what he's saying. In light of eternity, God kept me going out and coming in. He never took a shift off. He was always aware. He was watching over me. Elena, she turned 16 this last year. You pray for me. I'm teaching her to drive now. You teach boys to drive. That's very simple because you can yell at them. They just deal with it and they move on. Teach your daughter to drive. She says, how did I do? I went, eh, it was okay. She starts crying. I just said, it's okay. That's all I said. Remember when Elena was born. We were working at the church there in Kentucky. He was serving as pastor. And Elena was our third. When Elena was born, as soon as she was born, the doctors and the nurses take Elena. They immediately rush her out of the room. They never hand her to me. They never hand her to Amanda. They never even ask us a word. They just, just talking among themselves and they run off. Then they run out of the room with her. She was our third, so I kind of knew like something's up, something's not right. I stayed with Amanda for a while and a few hours went by. It seemed like much longer than that. And the doctors came in and said, Amanda's healthy and fine. She'll make a good recovery, but there's been a problem with Elena. She has a heart condition. It's not really for sure what it is, but she needs immediate pediatric care to which we cannot provide here. So we need to rush her to the children's hospital. We don't have but just a few moments. Or one, of, one of you 
Want to go with us? I hadn't even held my daughter at this point. I remember leaning over to Amanda. I said, what should I do? Let me stay with you. I'm going to go. She said, keep her safe. Kissed a man on the forehead, jumped in the back of a children's hospital, raced across downtown Louisville. What began the longest next 14 days of my life. Come to find out Elena has a heart condition. It's called non-sustained metamorphic ventricular tachycardia. Don't ask me to spell it. I can barely say it. There are chambers of her heart all beat at the same time. It causes loss of blood flow to her brain, her lungs. It's problematic. Remember watching Elena in this little bitty incubator, just this big. She has a big mask on her face. She didn't like the light. She had big earmuffs on her ears. She didn't like sound. She was wrapped in a blanket. She had nobody touching her, her skin. She had these gloves on her hands. If you turned on the light above her bed, she'd immediately cry. If you turned it off, she'd stop. If you reached in to pick her up, she'd immediately cry. If you reached out, she'd stop. I remember in that, that season, an elderly gentleman in the church came up to see a man and I just sitting at the hospital wondering, what in the world can we do? We can't even touch her, can't even hold her, can't even do nothing. I remember he walked in and he looked at Elena, hugged Amanda, put his hand on my shoulder, and he read this for chapter. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He said, Dave, God made this little girl. The doctors may not know all that's going on inside of her. You may not know all that's going on inside of her. But God does. Can I just tell you, friend? God made you. God watches over you. God loves you. And his eye is on you. The question tonight is not, is God's attention on us? The question tonight is, is our attention on him? He keeps me.